Ladies and gentlemen, again this evening, the Daily Classic has the pleasure of presenting to you the world's most eminent criminologist and crime commentator, The Shadow. Okay, you're on the air. The Shadow Speaks, bringing to you the latest news in the world of crime prevention and detection. This afternoon, a crime was committed which brought only tragedy to the perpetrators. Three young desperados held up a bank and escaped in their car. The police quickly picked up their trail. There was a running gunfight between bandits and police, which finally resulted in the three misguided young men plunging to their death. Once again is proved the truth of that old adage, crime does not pay. Well, friends, we have a distinguished visitor in our midst, but the news won't make the society page. Honest John is back in town. Honest John is one of the last of our old time safe crackers. So if your strong box blows up with a loud bang, don't think it's the 4th of July. It may be old John celebrating his release from what he probably calls the big house or stir. Let us hope that the police commissioner Weston, whom we hear never misses one of our broadcasts, will keep an eye on Honest John. Hi there, commissioner. Memorandum to Detective Bureau. Check on Honest John. Yes, commissioner. Ladies, here's a little incident which proves that silence is really golden. Last night, Bandits entered George Ward's furniture store. Mrs. Ward was alone in the place. The good lady was so frightened she couldn't talk. At least that's what the bandits... It's too bad something don't scare him so bad that he can't talk. There ought to be a law against guys like him shooting their mouth off within the city limits. But still Mrs. Ward refused to say a word. At the point of a gun, they took from the cash register a dollar bill and one thin dime. The moment they'd gone, Mrs. Ward calmly removed a hundred dollar bill from her mouth. Witnesses took the license number of the car, 3Y-41-37. I'll repeat that, 3Y-41-37. Did you make a note of that? Yes, sir, I did. Last night, young Michael Nolan took his pretty fiancee, Dorothy Walsh, for a drive along the scenic highway overlooking the city. With a bright lover's moon overhead, they stopped to enjoy the view and to romance. Today, police discovered their bodies in Nolan's car and are holding a transit named Miller for the murder. Well, you can't go in now, miss. The shadow's on the air. Oh, but I'm Phoebe Lane. Sorry, you couldn't get in there if you was Calamity Jane. But I'm working for the shadow. Well, I'm the shadow's shadow. Well, then just fade away, will you please, lady? But I've got important news that must go on the air right away. I've got it all written down here. Look here. Last night in John Morgan's warehouse, not a creature was stirring, not even the watch. This is my job. As robbers, si as robbers silently jimmied a window, they were uh, greeted by cries of, get out, get out. They did. An hour later, when police stopped to investigate the open window, the parrot was still screaming, get out, get out. Ladies and gentlemen, there seems to be a slight disturbance in the studio. Ladies and gentlemen, a news flash has just been handed to me. I can't guarantee its authenticity, but here it is. A big theater robbery is planned to take place downtown in half an hour, in fact, nine o'clock. Read the Daily Classic for particulars, and now the shadow bids you good night until tomorrow. You didn't give the name of the theater. The police won't know where to go. No, and neither will 10,000 other thrill-hunting sightseers. Uh, but hadn't you better phone the police? <laughs> I don't think you have to worry about that. Good night. Good night. Oh. Hello. Oh, hello, Commissioner. It's the police. Yes, I have that, too. The Metropolitan Theater. The Metropolitan Theater. See here, Cranston. If this turns out to be a phony tip, I have a good mind to sue you. If I can find the proper grounds. Why not breach a promise, Commissioner? Listen. Radio broadcasting. Hook me up for an emergency order to all cars. General Order 6-2. All radio cars concentrate in Sector 8. General Order 6-2. All radio cars concentrate in Sector 8. That is well, all. that's us again. Guess you'll have to get along without us, Frank. Well, I guess I can hold this down alone. Come on. Oh, by the way, Miss Lane, where did you get this tip? From a man. From a man? Well, who was it? Don't you know his name? No, but he had an honest face. Would you mind giving me some little hint about how you met this honest face? Well, there was an automobile accident. And suddenly I remembered I was a reporter for you. So I stopped and asked the people their names and addresses and things. And one man said, I can't give you my name and address, but I can give you a big story. And he did. 
That's what I'm afraid of. He said the Metropolitan Theater will be robbed tonight at 9 o'clock. Daylight saving or standard time? Goodness, I forgot to ask him that. And you had me put that choice morsel on the air. Well, he, he, he was so sincere and he had such, such an, an honest, honest face. face. Well, you better spend more time awake. How did she get in? Well, I tried to stop her, but she scratched me. Well, sir, did you hear that pipe dream I just had in the air? Yeah, where did you get it? A man told her. Told who? Phoebe Lane, the girl you wished on me. The honor student of college journalism. Say, will you get her out of my hair and put her back on the household page where she belongs? Not a chance, Cranston. She says she's all fed up with recipes and household hints. She wants to be a real reporter. Oh, I see. Romance and adventure stuff, huh? Well, Mr. Heath, is she running this newspaper or are you, sir? Cranston, as long as she happens to be the owner's niece, I'm afraid she can pick any seat she wants for a ride. Oh, it's one of those, is it? Well, there's no law against our making the joyride a little, shall we say, bumpy for her, is there? Not that I know of. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, this is Phoebe Lane, the real brains of the shadow who thinks he knows all about crime. But the real crime of the age is the way he makes you think he's so smart, when it's really me that does the work all the time. <laughs> Hello. I didn't see you. That's quite evident. Uh, I didn't mean what I said, Mr. Cranston. I hope you can forgive me. I wish I could forget you. Oh, oh if you think you're going to have a problem with a robbery without me, you're crazy. Then that is my story. Wait, wait for Phoebe. Hello, Mr. Cranston. Now listen, Mo, you're a fine driver and all that, but you're not working for me. You mean I'm fired? No, but you will be if you insist upon calling me by name. Now remember, you're no good to me unless you don't know me. Okay, stranger. Where to? The Metropolitan Theater. This is going to be thrilling, isn't it, Mr. Cranston? Yes, and dangerous too, particularly for you. For me? Why? Well, when the crooks start shooting, it seems they pick off the girl first. I never knew that. No, oh, a strange quirk in the criminal mind. Nobody seems to understand it. Oh, but I understand it. It's because they realize that the girl is really the smart one. They have to get her first. Miss Lane, why didn't you stick to the baby and biscuit end of the newspaper business instead of hurling yourself into the jaws of death? Because I'm tired of babies and biscuits. I want thrills, adventure, romance. Ah, but the household hint page is the place to find it. The home is the very symbol of romance. Oh, no, it isn't. The nearest I ever came to it was when a cross-eyed washing machine salesman tried to kiss me in a model kitchen. Young lady, you're impossible. Not if the right man comes along. Hang around a while, Mo. Okay, stranger. Where are the police? Oh, don't worry about that. They'll be around. Oh, well, we've got to warn the theater right oh, away. No, no, wait a minute. Let's do some window shopping first. Well. The boss of them all. Police Commissioner Weston in the flesh. And if this turns out to be a false alarm, he'll love me even less than he does now. Oh, but I'm sure it isn't because he had such, such an, an honest, honest face. Scram. Hello, Commissioner. Say, what kind of a song and dance is this? I hope you realize my whole department has been shifted just to take care of this tip-off. Maybe you'd rather have the theater robbed and let them chalk up another black mark against your record. Now, see here. We got crime down to the lowest level it's been in years. But the way you advertise it, people will think a crime wave is on. You might have twice as much to deal with if I didn't advertise the crime doesn't pay. I'm helping you. Well, I'd like to try running the department without your help. Just as an experiment. It's 9 o'clock. Well, well, well. How time flies. <laughs> To my violin. What are you taking in there for? What to play it? Of course, I am a violinist. Yeah? Let me see it. Please, be careful. It is very valuable. Shut up. See? I know lie. I'm sorry. I owe you an apology. Take those off.
I ought to send you to jail for life for bringing me out on such a wild goose chase. I didn't invite you. You crashed the party. Mr. Cranston, I consider you public nuisance number one. Good. I like to be first in everything, Mr. Weston. I got to phone the paper. <laughs> Hello, Heath. Cranston speaking. That robbery tip was just a gag to get the radio cars off their regular runs. Yes, I got a hunch something big is going to break elsewhere. Better hold page one in my column for remake. Oh, and have Burke stand by. Yeah, so long. Give me the captain. McCabe reporting, sir. Explosion in 93 Madeira Drive. Yes, sir. First you tell me to get all my cars down here to stop a robbery. Then you get me to rush them all back before there is a robbery. What kind of a merry-go-robbery is this anyway? I know, but calling then there's... All, calling all cars from District 9. Calling all cars from District 9. Explosion reported at 9-3 Madeira Drive. Explosion reported at 9-3 Madeira Drive. That's all. Oh, Mr. Cranston! Wait for me! Oh, Jack! Cranston, kindly keep your fingerprints to yourself. Riley, take the door. Have you searched the house? Yes, there's no one else here. What, no servants? Servants have a day off every week. Or haven't you heard? One in a house of this size is always someone on duty. Well, I want any information from you, I'll ask for it. That's fine. I've got to phone the paper anyway. Frank, is there a phone still working? In there. Thanks. Well, your mother's going to have a sick daughter if you don't scram out of here. How many of them were there? I, I, I really can't say, sir. Oh, come on. You must have some idea. Think back. I, I think there was only one, sir. I, I, I was grabbed from behind. Oh, I'm, I'm so shaky. I think I'd better go to bed. All right. Thank you. Stay with him, Tom. We're wasting time here. Get your men out and bring in the man who did this job. An old-time safe blower who just got into town. His name is, uh... Honest John? Honest John. Bring him in and we'll charge him with robbery and homicide. The motive of the crime wasn't robbery. How can you look at that safe and say the motive wasn't robbery? Don't you know that man's watch and wallet are gone? If it wasn't robbery, what was it? Murder. If it was robbery, they'd have taken the bonds, wouldn't they? Marvelous powers of observation. Why do you use the word they, Mr. Cranston? Because one man couldn't have done all this between the departure of the radio car and the time of the explosion. As I recall, you gave the impression Honest John was a very fast workman. Right, and much too efficient to be guilty of a botched up job like that. That blast wasn't set to blow a safe. It was calculated to kill whoever opened it. I say you're wrong. That's great. I'll see that your opinion is given its proper unimportance in my column tomorrow. There won't be any shadow column tomorrow. Oh, no? No, and for a long time to come. Inspector, kindly file this gentleman in one of our steel cabinets, somewhere out in the stick. Hmm, on what charge, Commissioner? Material witness. Thanks for being the first man on the scene of the crime. You certainly use your brain, Mr. Cranston. I wish I could say the same for you, sir. Oh, never mind those things. I don't go in for flashy jewelry. Hello? 
Give me the desk, sweetheart. Burke speaking. New lead off for Shatter Column. He says Weston all wet with robbery theory on Morton case. Says it's murder using robbery as a cover up. Honest John, nah. He's just as innocent as a new laid cornerstone. Oh, yeah, I say. Cranston's been pinched. Yeah. Held as material witness. On the way now to some hick town who's got. Oh, sure. Right on my toes. Well, so long, pumpkin puss. Take it easy, boys. I only want one of you for traffic court. You. Say, officer, I'm sure the judge wants to see me first. Ah, uh, go on back and sit down. I know who to let out and who not to. But I've got to get a message to my folks. Now, if you help me out, I'll take care of you. Take care of me? I'm taking care of you. Come on, get out of here. Hello, Heath. Well, I suppose you want to know what happened to your man, Cranston. After what you let him print yesterday, this is a fine time to call me up and ask for anything. But, Commissioner, you've got to let him out for the broadcast tonight. Why, thousands of people are waiting. To hear what else he has to say about the stupidness of the police department, huh? Well, let him wait. And furthermore, unless he changes his tune and lines up on our side, I'm going to cut off all police news from your paper. But the news is public property. You, you can't... Keep your men away from the records? Of course not. They can have the same access as other citizens. And I'd like to see you get out a newspaper on that. All right, Commissioner. Anything you say. But you've got to let the shadow out in time for his broadcast tonight. We can't disappoint the public. Can't disappoint the public, eh? Well, I can't mislead them either. Goodbye. But... We must have got cut off. Say, what are you in for? Nothing. You mean you've done nothing? Absolutely nothing. They're holding me without charge. Oh, well, now that son scrumptious. That's the great... That is why I never heard such a thing in my life. They, they can't do that to you. Hey, Jailer! Pardon me. Hey, Jailer. Keep your shirt on. I'm taking you out right now. Me? I don't want to go out. I've got a right to stay here. This is the man who wants to go out. Listen, tell that to the judge, and he'll take care of your friend and you too. Oh, don't you worry, everything's coming out. Now, wait a minute, don't handle me so rough. Well, don't worry, everything's coming out all right. Goodbye, old boy. I'll see you soon. I'll see you some more. Good luck. Have a good time. Just a moment. Wait, wait. I'll just be missing on the door. Everybody gets out but me. When you get out, make a phone call for me, will you? Sure, fella. I'll give you the number of the paper I'm working on. You call them. Come on, you. <laughs> yes, sir. I don't mean you, I mean you. Me? Yes, you. Yeah, your girlfriend's here with the Hapus Corpus, and that lets you out. <laughs> Good luck, pal. Nice little Phoebe to call for you. Yes, thanks a lot. Don't thank me, thank Mo. How much was it this time, Mo? Is this a place to talk business? Don't worry, it'll be on your bill. There too. The office. Okay, stranger. Well, where is Cranston? Well, he must be here. Well, he goes on the air in a few minutes. Well, where is he? You looking for me, sir? With millions of people about to tune in on your broadcast in a few minutes, 
I should worry where you are. You don't think I'd miss an opportunity to pay my respects to Commissioner Weston, do you? Now look here, Captain. You've got to lay off Weston. I see. He's been sticking a knife in me with one hand and patting himself on the back with the other, and you fell for it. You were smart enough to report crime without deliberately antagonizing the entire police department. Well, I try to take care of myself. Good evening, friends. Yes, it's your old shadow man, and after languishing in one of Commissioner Weston's small town jugs, the shadow is just a shadow of his former self. Now we'll get down to the Gerald Morton case and the reported difference of opinion between the shadow and his other shadow, Police Commissioner Weston. Friends, I am now of the opinion that our efficient police department, under the able guidance of the commissioner, Ladies and gentlemen, an emergency has arisen in the studio, and we must pause briefly for station identification. You're listening to station EMOR of the Daily Classic. Our program will continue in just a moment. Well, John, what can I do for you? So you're the guy that reminded the cops I was in town. But I spoke of you in a very complimentary way. I said you were tops in your profession. No man can ask for more than that, can he? Yeah, but you sounded off that I'd done that amateurish Martin job. That's my beef. Now listen, when I was cracking safes, which I ain't no more, I was so good I could lift the door off, lay it on a blanket as gentle as a mother's kiss. <laughs> I know that, my friend. I ain't no friend of yours. Now you turn the heat on me and you're gonna turn it off, see? Now go ahead. Start talking. Tell them who really done that job. Go on. Right into that microscope. <laughs> but I don't know. If you can't think of anybody else, tell them you done it. My friends, now that I have the situation in the studio absolutely under control, we can resume our discussion of the Morton murder mystery. Why was Gerald Morton murdered? He is said to have been a good man, a charitable and benevolent man, a man without enemies. But although Mr. Morton's character seemed almost too good to be true, other men, supposedly paragons of virtue, have met violent ends, and investigation has developed some extremely unsavory facts. If my own investigation should develop a hidden side of Mr. Morton's life, I shall tell you all about it tomorrow. Well, what about me? I can now inform the police commissioner that Honest John is absolutely innocent of the explosion which caused the death of Gerald Morton. As a matter of fact, John, that job wasn't up to your usual professional standards, was it? No. I done better than that when I was still wearing short pants. Surely. Now, I ain't squawking about the cops pinning a murder on me, but when they tries to hang an amateurish job like that Martin blow up on me, I resent it, see? Naturally, naturally. I'll get him. Take a general order. Effective immediately. There you are, ladies and gentlemen. You've just had the pleasure of hearing Honest John in person. You mean I was on the air? You were, John, and thank you. <laughs> you, you, you dumb ox, why don't you look where you're going? Ladies and gentlemen, for the past 24 hours, the entire police force of this city have been trying to locate Honest John. Yet the shadow has had no difficulty in bringing him to you on this program this evening. For further details, please read the classic. This is the shadow saying goodbye until the same time tomorrow. Here's everything ever published on Gerald Morton. Now let's get busy. No, well, let's not. Well, uh, well, uh, what are you going to do? I don't know. You mean you don't know? That's right. The shadow doesn't know. Have one? Uh-uh, I tried it once and it made me dizzy. Oh, so that's what caused it. Good night. Good night. This case is getting to be a bore. Why don't you hurry and make something happen? Miss Lane, when lightning is about to strike, one doesn't try to hurry it. Well, nice going, Cranston. You fixed things up just dandy. Now, Weston is shut down on all police news, all fire news, and all hospital news. From now on, it's no news for us. Splendid. No news is good news, they say. And that honest John gag. What is the idea of staging that stunt with a dumb stooge? Mr. Heath, that was no stooge. That was honest John himself with a gun at my head. You mean the man that just went out? 
Miss Lane wants excitement, but doesn't know it when she bumps into it. Oh. I don't care if this does make me dizzy. <coughs> oh, hello, Matt. How are you? Well, where is he? You mean Honest John, I suppose. Yeah. I do believe, as he'd say himself, that he's taken it on the lam. Why didn't you hold him? <laughs> Well, why should I? I'm not the police commissioner. Then quit acting like a chump. <laughs> you know, I think he's got something there. Phoebe, thank you. You're a gentleman and a lady. Now, here, stop this clowning. How are we going to get the paper off the spot you two have got it on? We're not clowning, Mr. Heath, and please don't blame Miss Lane. It was my fault. I thought I was See, doing wait something. wait a minute. I think you hit an angle in your broadcast. Where you hinted that Morton's character wasn't all it should be. No, the... Oh, with my offer. Right? Johnny, I believe you have to right. Yes, please. Cranston? I'm Mr. Cranston. What can I do for you, sir? I am Roger Morton, brother of the Gerald Morton, whose name you tried to besmirch in your broadcast. I came over to see just what sort of man could be guilty of such an attack. Well, I'd like to explain that. I don't the... know what you meant by your hint about a hidden side in my brother's life. But in the presence of my attorney... I beg your pardon, I... Our firm has great commitments abroad, young man. And your paper will pay the penalty if you do or say anything to jeopardize our international dealings. And we deal in millions. That's all. Good night. Good night. Now what are you going to do? I'll uh, tell you what he's going to do. He's going to handle the story Morton's way, or he'll sue us for millions. Nice thing. Honest John says I handle it his way or he'll shoot me. Weston says I handle it his way or I go to jail. I think you've started all this, sweetheart. Have you got any suggestions? Don't ask me. You're the great big detective. And there you are. You see, she craves action. When she runs into it, she starts passing the buck. I wish you'd go home and roll your hoop so we can roll up our sleeves and get to work. I'll admit you have performed miracles, like that Allen murder. But there you had a Ben Penn to start with as a clue. This time you have nothing. You're right. Nothing. Don't forget you've still got Phoebe. Well, we don't want you shot. You're no good to us in jail, and we can't afford to offend Morton. There it is, son. Get us out of it. Just like nothing happened. Well, Miss Lane. Miss Lane went home to roll her hoop. Phoebe. I wonder if Miss Lane would recognize the man that gave her the tip that started all this. Miss Lane would know him anywhere. She never forgets a face. <laughs> Well, um, what did he look like? Oh, he was thin. Well, well, not too thin. No. And, uh... Blonde? Uh, he was between a blonde and a brunette, and rather medium size for a man. And he was thin and... and... Oh, but I said that, didn't yes, I? Yes, yeah, yes, you did. My, my, what a memory. Anyway, he wasn't bad looking. Well, go on. Anything else? Anyhow, I know how he spoke. How? With a foreign accent. A foreign accent? Mm -hmm. Listen, that's important. Uh, was it uh, a Moscow Russian? I will give you a tip about oh, a theater. Oh, no. No, it wasn't that, I see. Uh, Italian, perhaps, more liquid. Uh, Signora, do we know about the theater? No, 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 no. No, it no. wasn't that. Mm -hmm. French, of course, it wouldn't be French. There is a theater that will be robbed tonight. Oh, no, 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 that's not right. Okay. A German, perhaps. I can give you a tip about a theater around the corner that's, that's going... Nearer. That's, that's nearer, that's nearer. Mm -hmm. Perhaps a little finer, huh, mm -hmm. Viennese? Um, I can give you a tip about a theater around the corner that... You, 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 you've got it. That's exactly the way he spoke. Fine. And I'm sure I'd recognize him now if I saw him. Good. Thank you, Miss Lane. Now you can go home. Oh, wait a minute. Let me finish before you go away mad. Uh, go home, put on your nicest dinner dress, and I shall call for you between 9.30 and 10 o'clock. You mean I'm going to be wined and dined for remembering his accent? No, sweetheart. The idea is to find the man. I don't get it. When you want to find an American, you go where he works. When you want to find a foreigner, you go where he dines. My, but you're clever. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see now. Should I wear black or blue? Or You'll wear I... black and blue if you don't hurry. Scram, sister.
more caviar for madame? Oh, no, no. If I eat any more of that buckshot, I'll pass out. Hey, don't you dare pass out until we find that man. Buckshot? Oh, 1.30. I've looked at so many men that they all look alike, and I'm so tired. Now, I thought you wanted to be a reporter. Now, listen, you stick around until we find the man, then you can go home. Go home the very minute the fun begins? Me? Really, I'm not going to do all the hunting and then miss the shooting. Oh, now, be reasonable, will you, Phoebe? You're the boss niece. I can't let anything happen to you. Why did I have to be born a relative? Why couldn't I have been born an orphan or something? I thought you said he was good looking. Are you sure that's the man? I'm positive. I'm sorry, sweetheart. You have to scram. Sorry, I have made a mistake. You are not my old friend, Captain Litzman, as I thought. <laughs> my mistake was a natural one. You know, I have not seen Litzman since we flew together in the war. Uh, I see you are an ace also. May I know the name? Mine is Stolsky, Baron Stolsky. I'm called Floto, and this is my friend Starkov. How do you do? I was told when I arrived in America recently that I could meet and make friends with many people of my own class. <laughs> I am glad that is so. Waiter, uh, gentlemen, what will we drink? Lassau 26. And make sure it is 26, please. Très bien, monsieur. Thank you. You Hello, know, darling. Well, aren't you going to introduce me, Precious? After all, I am your wife, you know. Or do you? Oh, yes. Uh, forgive me. Baron Stolsky, may I present Mr. Floto, Mr. Starkoff, my new friend. How do you do? How do you do? Thank you very much. For a recent arrival in America, as I say over here, you must be a fast worker to have married so charming a girl so soon. Well, it, it was a whirlwind courtship. We met on Wednesday, I proposed on Thursday, and uh, well, we were married on the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> <laughs> you met her through her newspaper work? Newspaper work? Yes. You're a reporter for the Daily Classic, are you not? Why? Why, no, there, there must be some mistake. Why, I'm just not clever enough to be a reporter, am I, darling? No, darling. Pardon my mistake. America is a land of women so beautiful, they all look alike. Yes. Sorry, monsieur, I cannot save you. The bar is closed. It's after closing hour. Oh, that's too bad. I had counted on talking over old times with you. But my apartment is never closed. Come, we'll go and have a drink and chat before we break up. Uh, uh, I'm afraid we cannot join you. You know, the Baroness never keeps late hours. Oh, but one evening won't matter, darling. We'd be delighted to go. Come on, dear. Taxi, taxi. Midtown Apartments. Oh, no. You see, it is a raining night. I'm sorry, and it's so late. I must take my wife home, I'm sure. But the Midtown apartments are not far from here. Yes, darling, and I'd love to have another drink. Oh, dumb. Oh! Oh, you see, you see oh. my wife gets these attacks, you know, when it's late and raining. I'm, I must take her home, but we will see you tomorrow for luncheon. Shall we say at the Hofbrau at one? The Hofbrau, one o'clock punctually. Good. Yes. Where to? At 12 Dutton Street. Okay, Spencer. Good night, gentlemen. Good night. Good night. Mm. You ought to let this coffee write your column. 
It's strong enough. <laughs> Good strong coffee for a strong, silent man. <laughs> How's this? The shadow says that his statements over the air yesterday regarding the character of Mr. Gerald Morton were unjustified. And those statements are hereby withdrawn with due apologies to Mr. Morton's family. Yeah, but you have to apologize to Commissioner Weston. Let's not go overboard in our enthusiasm for whitewashing ourselves. But you've got to square the paper with Weston. Tell how it happened. Describe the scene. You with the mic and Honest John with the gun. I was afraid you'd be expecting that, so I wrote it last night. But I don't like it. My apologies to Commissioner Weston. Perhaps he's right in his belief that Honest John is the killer. My statement on the air that the man was innocent was made while John himself was holding a gun at my head. And I hope that the Commissioner, with his usual fair-mindedness, will restore the classic to favor. Great. Now Martin can't sue us. And the Commissioner will have to restore our news. Oh. I spend years building up a reputation as a crime expert, then have to expose myself as a stuffed shirt that gets kicked around by the police department. Well, look here, son. If you're so keen about that reputation of yours, why don't you really try to solve this case? Well, I would if I weren't so busy taking care of the boss's niece. Did you check? Who is he? The shadow. The criminologist. He is not to be taken lightly. Neither were the best detectives of Paris, London, New York. Yet, here we are. An amateur. Well, Mr. Cranston, how are you feeling this morning? Now listen, Mo, for the last time. If you ever call me by name again or recognize me, or even speak to me before you're spoken to... I'm fired! That's right. Okay, stranger. Mr. Cranston is. There's something wrong, Stalker. There's something wrong with your nerves, my friend. We are not going to leave here with our work half finished. Yes, yes. I know how much there's at stake. That's why I'm so uneasy. That's right. Tell everybody we're here. Suppose Flodo or Starkoff would have been behind this door instead of me. Oh, but they couldn't be. They're both at the restaurant. And I thought you'd be there having lunch with them, too. Oh, and this would be a good time to do a little detecting. Uh-huh. Well, for once you had a good idea. Well, come on, let's get busy and look for the clue. So you've got a clue, have you? Why, yes. The watch and the wallet that were missing from the man's body. Hmm. And where do you suggest we look for them? Well, my mother always used to hide things in the mattress and... Oh, if we could only find a teapot, I'm sure it would be in there. Well, then all we have to do is find a teapot. Uh-huh. Come on, let's get started. Telephone, Mr. Floto. Hello. We have waited long enough, Rudolph. Has our man come home from downtown? Not yet, sir. I understand he won't be home before late. It's to meet our countrymen here for a final conference tonight. We must know his plans. Keep in touch with us at the apartment. We shall be there in a few minutes. Waiter. Yes, sir. Check, please. At once. Now, I don't think we should go. I think we should definitely stay here and find that watch and wallet. Now, my, my woman's, woman's intuition... intuition. Hello? 
This is Flotto. The master has just gotten home. Early in the afternoon will occur an opportunity when he is gone. No more. Someone is coming. I call you back. What's happened? Uh, just a minute. Operator, uh, can you trace that last call to this number, please? Uh, but it's important. Oh, I see. Uh, thank you. Are they going to trace the call? Oh, they can't trace a call on the dial phone. What are we going to do now? Well, wait till he calls back. Till who calls back? The fellow I just talked with. Hello, hello. We were afraid we had missed you. We've been waiting and waiting, haven't we, dear? What are you doing here? Well, we came for the luncheon. But the appointment was to have luncheon at the restaurant. Oh, how stupid of me. You know, I'm afraid last night when we made the appointment, my mind wasn't on it. You know, my wife had that attack. I trust she's better now. No, I'm afraid she's even worse. Aren't you, dear? Make her comfortable. We soon have lunch. Oh. <coughs> oh, poor darling. No, you see, she's getting another attack. I must take her for the air right away. Just a minute, Mr. Cranston. Your hand, Mr. Shadow. What do you suspect us all? And why? <laughs> oh, well, now, you'll have to listen to the broadcast to hear that. You see, our business is to get interviews, not to give them. Isn't it, sweetheart? Y yes, sir. And uh, may we go now? No. Now that we have you here, you are going to stay. Take your time, mister. Taxi stranger. Scram, Phoebe. Thanks for your hospitality, boys. <sighs> nice work, Mo. Mo? I thought we were strangers. Have a cigarette, pal? <laughs> <laughs> He will not go to the police. What makes you think so? Because he prefers to work alone. Hello. What's that? That wasn't I. We were not at home then. That was Cranston. Repeat what you told him. It's Rudolph. He told Cranston his master would be at home this afternoon and that an opportunity might occur to strike. That's indefinite. But incriminating. You must act at once, today. Tomorrow may be too late. Naturally, my woman's intuition told me that we should get out of there, but I was afraid to tell you because I thought you'd laugh at me. Well, thank goodness it's all over. There's nothing to worry about now. You take your woman's intuition and go to luncheon. Oh, trying to get rid of me. Well, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to miss any more fun. Well, I've got some work to do. Now, you run along, please. All right. It's a good girl. Bert. Bert. Bert! Bert! Come on, get up and get going. Where to? Go to the Midtown Apartments, stake out, watch for two foreigners in a closed car. Phone me as soon as they leave. Okay. And hurry for a change, will you? Okay, Chief. Hello? Oh, yes, Mr. Heath. No, still as much in the dark as ever. Well, those fellas are rather clever. As a matter of fact, they're planning another deal right now. <laughs> well, if I knew that, I wouldn't be hanging around here work. Pardon me. Come in. Oh, hello, Barrow. Sit down. Be right with you. Yes, Heath. No, thanks. I don't need you. What I need is a clairvoyant. Right. So long. I have that Morton information for you. Good. I understand that Gerald Morton's firm was interested in some very big international deals. Was that right? Yes, they still are. I made these notations for you. Their recent underwritings include 10 million Argentine fours, 28 million Danish refunding two and a halfs. And I understand they'll soon issue several new European debentures. Well, uh, what about them? That might be a good investment for me. Certainly. However, these new bonds that Morton and Morton are about to offer seem to me to be highly speculative. 
But if the 50 million is spent to build up the army as intended, the exiled aristocrats will never succeed with their threatened revolution. Good. That's what I wanted to find out. Oh, pardon me. Uh, Miss Lane, do you know Mr. Barrows, our financial editor? How do you do? How do you do? What's this all about? At a time like this, you're talking about investments. I'll be with you in a minute. Editorial. Editorial. Cranston speaking. Whole shadow column for remake. Right. I brought you some lunch. I was in such a hurry, I dropped your bottle of beer, but we can share mine. A good assistant would never let her boss go hungry. Oh, thank you, Miss Lane. And now will you phone the commissioner and tell him I'll call him back later? What's his number? Uh, you'll find it in the book. Commissioner, first edition on the streets now, with a full explanation apology by the shadow. Hmm. The apology could have been stronger. I, uh, I hope this uh, paves the way for renewing friendly relations. I'm no enemy of the shadow. I always give him credit for being somewhat clever, but he should remember he's only an amateur. Yeah. After all, we're professionals. Uh, that's right, Commissioner. And I hope that uh, you'll restore the daily classic to good standing with the department uh, uh, right away. Of course I will. Take a general order. Cigar, Commissioner? No, thanks. Wait till you get a load of this, Phoebe. The Martin case will break wide open tonight, and it'll be a big surprise to the police. Mm, pardon me. Under the misguidance of Commissioner Weston, the department has wasted 24 hours searching for the wrong man, with the right men under their noses all the time. But won't uh, that make the Commissioner furious? Pardon me. Uh, you would get hard-boiled eggs. And although the murders have completely baffled the police by their shrewdness and daring, oh, pardon me, the shadow knows who they are and why they killed Gerald Morton. But how do you know that? We didn't find a single clue and nothing to suggest a motive. Ah, yes, we did. And you know when it happens. You're intelligent. You sparkle. I don't know what I'd have done without you on this case, but we've got to keep going. Here, rush this down for the night edition. Yes, sir. Well, hurry. <laughs> you not to fight Weston. You've ruined the paper with your grandstanding. Even if you have added a hundred thousand new readers to our circulation. Maybe you're right. Maybe I did pull a boner. I did it to keep the confidence of our readers, to prove that we've tried to expose stupidity wherever it exists. For years we've been trying to educate them and their children to obey the law. Now maybe you're willing to undo all the good we've done, but I'm not, Mr. Heath. Well, neither am I. But I've got the paper to think of. Suppose you're wrong in this case. Why, they'll laugh you out of town. What if you don't solve this murder this afternoon? Then I'm through, washed up. No more shadow column and no shadow. But if I'm right and Weston's wrong, he's the one that has to change his tune. He'll have to work hand in hand with me, and between the two of us, there'll be so little crime in this city, it'll be a crime. That's the spirit. <laughs> now you're talking. Yes, sir. I make four straight passes right in the road. Then I fix up them dice again. Breeze on him, and I said, come on, baby, Papa needs the dough. Mm. And right there, the little cop comes along. Oh, man. So how's that, boss? A boss? Shine him again, will you, boy? Again? I done shot him three times. Ah! Uh, look out there, boss. 
Let's put that in the wheel and kill somebody. A boss was shining money. We'll have the usual introduction and uh, then naturally work out the theme that crime doesn't pay. Answer that, will you please, Miss Lane? Hello. Yes, this is Mr. Cranston's office. Who should I say we should speak to him? I can't hear you. Oh, I'm so sorry. It sounded just like you were yawning. Oh, I know who that is. I'll take it, thanks. Hello, Bert. Yes, what's up? Bag and baggage, huh? Which way did they go, west? Never mind how I knew. Yeah, so long. I've got to run. Now, if you want to help me, you'll stay here and finish those notes. Uh, well, you're just trying to get rid of me. No, not at all, really. If whether or not I go on the air tonight is advertised depends absolutely upon you. Now, you wouldn't let me down, would you, pal? You bet I won't, pal. All right, so long. Hello, Fender. Hello, uh, 896 Clover Road, and hurry. Okay, Mr. Jensen. Mo, you're fired. I've warned you a dozen times. Yeah, and I warned you once. Get in. You two, in the first break you make, you're driving a dead passenger. I know I did you wrong, John, but I'll square it later. I'm in a hurry now. Let's talk it over some other time. There ain't gonna be any other time for you, buddy. You can't laugh this off. My apologies to Commissioner Weston. I'm now convinced that he's right in his belief that Honest John is the killer. Oh, that's only the first edition. I had the red apple, the commissioner. Wait till you read the final edition. This is the final edition for you, buddy. Just a minute. Another move like that, and I'm going to let you have it right here. I was only reaching for a cigarette. <laughs> you got a cigarette, driver? I got you covered now, pal. Well, suppose you left the pen, and you want to go straight to... You come to town looking for an honest job? What do you get? A bum murder rap hung on you. Do you really want to go straight, John? Oh, my word of honor. Have a cigarette. What? Well, now go ahead and plug me. Anybody dumb enough to fall for that one's got it coming. <laughs> Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Miss Phoebe Lane in the Shadow Shadow. If Police Commissioner Weston is listening in, I should like him to know that the Shadow and I think he's the world fried sap. And we intend to leave no stone unturned. The Shadow knows who killed Gerald Morton and why. We'll be on the air at 8 p.m. this evening as usual. Well, we'll see about that. Matthews, what's the law covering withholding of evidence from the police? Section 164, revived criminal code, sir. Get out a warrant for Cranston and pick him up at once. Yes, sir. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I'll give you my own story of how I helped the Shadow to solve the Gerald Morton murder mystery. In the first place, Commissioner Weston and his very dumb stooge, Detective Inspector Matthews, were off on a false scent, as usual, and... and Keep right on, sister. You were going great. Oh, I'm so sorry. You frightened me so I didn't know what I was saying. And I, I never know what I'm saying when I'm frightened, sir. You want to see Mr. Cranston? Yeah, just to say hello. You're not going to arrest him again. Oh, no. Cranston and I are old personal friends. Oh, then I can tell you where he is. He's out in the Morton case. Ah, Morton. Hmm. Thank you. Be sure to thank Mr. Cranston for me. Well, thank you, Mr. Matthews. I certainly will. I'm sure he'll thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye. Remember your instructions, Stefan.
Sorry if I uh, kept you waiting, gentlemen. Our appointment wasn't until later. We are not the men you are expecting, but we are here regarding the same matter. Won't you sit down? I, uh, really, there's no need of that. The business is out of the confidential stage and the deal is about to be concluded. The deal will never be concluded. You will kindly take out all negotiable bonds and securities and any large amount of money. This is uh, all I have of value here. Mrs. Morton's jewels and the bulk of my holdings are in the bank vault downtown. And if you want to... This is not a robbery, Mr. Morton. This is a matter of international diplomacy. These bonds represent much money, do they not? A hundred thousand dollars or more. I don't see what ends you can gain by killing me. Let us review the history of the international loan you were about to make tonight. Three years ago, a French banker was about to lend that money. He died in an auto accident. The loan was next negotiated with an English financier who was very much devoted to his wife, Mr. Martin. He committed suicide. So you see, we have many ways of taking care of those who oppose us. But say you did kill me. There are other banking houses. You can't prevent them all from dealing with your country. We intend that the death of both partners and Martin and Martin shall throw this band issue into such litigation as will hold it in the courts indefinitely. Unfortunately, you were not with your brother at the time of the accident we planned for both of you. So now, you will do as I suggest. Or, if you're stubborn, we'll wait for Mrs. Morton. What do you want me to write? The death of your brother will make necessary that you account to his estate for your interest in the firm, will it not? Of course. Good. We take these. Your accounts are 100,000 short. You are faced with exposure as a faithless partner, as a thief of your brother's money. You understand? Now you know what to write, Mr. Morton. Answering an unspoken question, there's only one bullet. But there are two of us. Good shot, John. Are you surprised to see me? You won't need this now, Mr. Morton. Oh, Flodo, I thought you were clever. Even a small town constable could spot that concealed weapon. Uh, you better let me take care of that, Mr. Morton. Watch him, John. <laughs> oh, hello, Matt. Hello. How did you get here? Weston sent me out to pick you up. You're under arrest. What, again? What's the charge this time? Withholding evidence in the Morton case. As usual, the commissioner is late. Hey, you! If it's my last act on earth, I'll put you in jail for life. Okay, you're on the air. The shadow speaks, announcing that the Morton case has at last been solved and the murderers are now in the custody of our able police. This has been one of the most baffling cases in the shadow's experience, a case without a clue. 
Murderers too clever to be caught by ordinary methods. And had it not been for the able cooperation of the police department, the case would still be unsolved. I have already handed Commissioner Weston a bouquet today. But now I wish to do so publicly and to compliment him for his shrewdness in causing the killer to think he and his men were following a false clue. As a result, the murderer and his accomplices were later taken in the act of attempting the life of Mr. Roger Morton. For the complete story, read the Daily Classic. And now, my friends, I'm going to ask Miss Lane, the lovely young lady who assisted in the solution of this crime, to tell her own story. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Miss Phoebe Lane. <laughs> Uh, ladies and gentlemen, there seems to be a great deal of static interference this evening. And anyway, we thank Miss Lane for her very vivid description. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, crime does not pay. This is the shadow saying goodbye until our next broadcast.